We'll move on to examination of the abdomen. The first thing you need to do is make sure that your patient is comfortable and draped adequately. Any discomfort on the part of the patient will impact on the abdominal musculature, and the abdominal musculature is really your enemy in terms of palpation of the abdomen. So you want your patient as relaxed as possible. To help with relaxation of the abdominal wall, you want to have them bend their knees up. Go ahead and bend both knees and keep their arms either at their sides or across their chest, not behind their head because again, that tenses up the abdominal wall. You want good exposure of the abdomen, ideally down to the anterior superior iliac spines on both sides. Um, and the patient is already draped um, pretty much ideally for this exam. In the abdominal exam, for the first time, the order of the steps changes. Remember that usually it's inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. In the abdominal exam, auscultation comes after inspection and palpation is done last. That's because palpation can really change the character of bowel sounds and alter the focus of your exam. So for this particular exam, you'll do inspection, followed by auscultation, then percussion, and then palpation. The inspection step is, uh, as they have been up to this point, usually done with tangential light. You're looking for skin characteristics, symmetry, and you're looking for expected pulsations. You expect to see in most patients the pulsation of the aorta, but you don't expect to see much else. And so you're looking for what you expect to see as well as taking note of anything you don't expect. After the inspection step, you will listen. We will listen for two things. For bowel sounds, you can do this with the diaphragm or the bell. And then for brewies, and you always listen for brewies with the bell because they're a low-pitched sound. We'll listen for brewies in six different spots. We will listen in the at the renal artery locations, which is just under the costal margin in the midclavicular lines bilaterally. We'll listen high on the aorta and lower on the aorta. And then we'll listen to the iliac vessels about halfway between the umbilicus and the anterior superior iliac spines. So let's do that auscultation step. I'm going to establish that I'm using my bell. And I'm just going to put my stethoscope down and listen for bowel sounds. If you don't hear any bowel sounds initially, you want to listen for a full minute. Um, within a minute, you should uh, hear something. Most of the time, you'll put your stethoscope down and hear something immediately. Now we're going to listen for our brewies below the costal margins in the midclavicular line. High on the aorta. lower on the aorta, and then about halfway between the umbilicus and the anterior superior iliac spine bilaterally. Remember that you're listening through bowel sounds, perhaps through transmitted heart sounds, so you really are concentrating for that low-pitched sound of a brewery when you're doing that particular step. After the auscultation step is the percussion step, and we percuss for both approximate liver size and for splenic enlargement. So you'll be using your percussion technique again, which I know you've been practicing. And to do that, you'll start low in the abdomen and move upward to find the lower border of liver dullness, and then start high in the chest and move downward to find the upper border of liver dullness. When you're tapping on the belly, that tone is usually considered to be tympanitic because there's usually air in the intestine that rises to the surface. You want to listen for the difference between that tympanic note and the dullness of liver percussion. When you come down from the chest, remember that the chest is considered to be resonant, on the right side at least, and you're listening for the difference between resonance and that liver dullness. So let's see if we can hear anything. You want to start low enough and high enough so that you get used to the tympanic note or the resonant note so that you can hear the difference once you get to some dullness. So let's see what we can hear.
right about there was a change. I don't know if it's easily appreciated. Let's try that again. Okay. I would mark about at that location for the lower border of liver dullness. Let's come down from the top and see if we can get the upper border. And that changes about there. So between this and this point is our approximated liver size. Now we'll move over to the other side to see if we can assess for splenic enlargement. To do this, you need to put your middle finger of your non-dominant hand into the last inner space in the anterior axillary line. The way you find that is to go underneath the rib cage and then move up one inner space in the anterior axillary line and tap. This would normally be a tympanic note. You then have your patient take some deep breaths in, go ahead and deep breathe, and out, listening for any change in that note. Go ahead and do that again. And out. I don't appreciate a difference. So tympany remained tympany. If tympany changed to dullness, then that might signify the fact that an enlarged spleen was moving down with lowering of the diaphragm. Now it may mean that a loop of bowel fluid-filled loop of bowel move down into the field as well. So it's not specific for whether or not the spleen is enlarged, but the fact that you hear a difference should make you very careful in your subsequent palpation for splenic enlargement, which we'll do next. So we've inspected, we've auscultated, and we've percussed. Uh, we've percussed for approximate liver size, and we've percussed for potential splenic enlargement. Now we're ready to do our palpation. And I think that, by far, this is one of the most difficult steps in the exam. It looks simple when you watch it being done, but it is difficult to coordinate uh, smoothness of the uh, palpation across the abdomen, the technique that you use to have the patient breathe and relax the abdominal musculature for liver and splenic palpation is somewhat challenging, and so I think that you'll need to practice this um, probably extensively before you feel comfortable doing it. The structures that you are trying to feel in the abdomen are softer than the abdominal musculature that overlies them. So you're at a disadvantage, especially in younger patients or patients with very good abdominal musculature, to try and feel those, those less firm structures below. So again, this is just something that experience uh, will uh, help you improve with. We're going to start with light palpation of the abdominal wall. That is followed by deeper palpation of the abdominal wall, then palpation for the liver edge and palpation for the spleen. And we'll go through these step by step. In order to do your light palpation, and it is exactly what it sounds like, light palpation, you put your dominant hand on the abdominal wall, and then you can cover it with your non-dominant hand, and you're basically moving backwards and forwards with a light touch to try and feel for anything in the superficial uh, skin and subcutaneous tissue. You want to cover the entire abdominal wall, including the flanks, in overlapping sections so that if there were something in the subcutaneous tissue, uh, you can imagine that you're trying to feel for a marble in the subcutaneous tissue, that you would find it and wouldn't miss it because you're overlapping and covering the whole area. It's relatively light again. This is probably more ticklish for a ticklish patient than the deep palpation. Getting up into the epigastrium and making sure you get over into the flanks. So again, the things that you want to be watching for is that you have a logical coverage of the abdominal wall and flanks, that you are feeling gently in overlapping areas for any abnormalities or masses in the subcutaneous tissue. That's the light palpation sequence. For the deep palpation sequence, you really are trying to get as deep into the abdominal cavity as you can. Uh, again, with good abdominal musculature, your task is somewhat difficult. That's why you want your patient as relaxed as possible. We will use breathing techniques to try and relax the abdominal musculature a little bit later. You use the same hand position with your dominant hand 
on the surface and your non-dominant hand doing the pressure application so that you're feeling with your dominant hand, which is your more sensitive hand, and you're using pressure from your non-dominant hand to achieve depth in the exam. You will use the same sequence as you did for the light palpation, but this time you're going to, in each location, use kind of a stair step technique to feel at one level, then try to get down a little deeper, then try to get down a little deeper until you simply can't get down deeper um, because of the discomfort that that would cause the patient or because of the abdominal musculature preventing you from doing that. This is not a real comfortable portion of the exam. It shouldn't hurt, but I think that many patients will tell you that when they're being deeply palpated, it's somewhat uncomfortable. So you want to be sensitive to that with your patient. You want to tell them that if they need a break or if this is very uncomfortable, they need to tell you. So will you tell me that, patient? Okay. We'll start again in the right lower quadrant, put our dominant hand down, our non-dominant hand over it, and use kind of a stair-step maneuver to get pretty deep into the abdomen. And then we'll move along, overlapping, but pushing ever harder to try and feel for those underlying structures. And I guess if you thought about searching for a golf ball inside the abdominal cavity, um, would your pattern adequately cover the abdominal cavity in order to find something that was within it. How you doing, patient? Okay. Not real comfortable, is it? No. No. <laughs> but again, shouldn't hurt, and you do want to let your patient ask for a break if it's... Okay, so that is the deep palpation pass. Next, we're going to use, have the patient help us with some breathing techniques to relax the abdominal wall and try to feel the liver edge. In order to feel the liver edge, we are going to actually push up from behind with our left hand by putting that behind the patient's back and then having the patient lay back on it. So you go ahead and lay back. But I'll be pushing forward with this left hand. I'm going to start with my palpating hand about the level of the umbilicus and in about the midclavicular line. If you can visualize, your left hand is pushing forward towards your right hand that is on the anterior uh, abdominal wall. And you're using the relaxation of exhalation to change the position of your right hand and then pushing down on the abdominal wall. Then during inspiration, that lowering of the diaphragm will bring the liver edge as low as possible and maximize your chance of feeling it. So with each inspiration, you'll be set in place and be feeling for that liver edge. And then during each expiration, you'll be moving the side of your hand towards the shoulder and positioning for the next inspiration. We'll use the same technique for splenic palpation, but this time we're going to put our patient in the right lateral decubitus position. So I'm going to have you put this hand behind your head and kind of roll towards me. Okay. You'll put your left hand behind the patient's back, pushing forward, and again, starting below the umbilicus, use the patient's breathing to try and feel that spleen. So go ahead and take some deep breaths for me. Inward. Inspiration, feel, move on expiration. Inspiration, feeling for any splenic edge. Move on expiration. My hand is kind of heading towards my other hand. Inspiration, feel. Expiration, move. Inspiration, feeling. Expiration, moving. Inspiration, feeling, till that costal margin pretty much stops you. Good, then you can roll your patient back on their back. And that is, completes the abdominal exam.